Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Danny Sims wrote to me all about his observations in Fiji over several years, and it was a very interesting perspective. And I thought, hey, you know what? Let's get Danny on the show and share it with you all. Danny's on the line now, and he joins me. Welcome to The Crunch, Danny. Glad you came. Glad to be here. So you, you wrote me a letter, and it was about um, about cruising in your yacht in Fiji in the winters following Bainu Marama's takeover. Yeah. So let's just talk about that. Yeah, well, um, it was an interesting time. Uh, I was uh, stuck in Fiji once this particular year, 2012, when uh, I had some trouble on my yacht and we had to get some repairs done at uh, Wunder Point uh, by outfit called Baobab Marine. They did a great job for me, but in that time, I got to know the local people quite well. I, I mixed with them, mingled with them, and uh, we had a lot of conversations. So, uh, you know, it was fairly front of mind stuff with Bani Marama in those days. And the New Zealand media and the Australian media and the respective governments uh, were vilifying him and, and uh, calling him all sorts of nasty names. And so I was interested to find out what the locals thought of him. Mm. And uh, all, all I know is what they told me. I'm, I'm not uh, sort of, I've made no opinions of my own. I didn't uh, try to concoct anything. I just listened to these people and, and I, I, I sort of got a bit of a uh, outline of what went on. Yeah, well that, so this is in 2006, 2007, you were up there? No, uh, the, the Barney Rama took over in 2006. We were up there uh, one of the time we'd been there before, but the time where I got all this information was 2012. Oh, right. So quite a, a few years later and before the 2014 election. So people had had a good chance to have a look at, at Frank Barney Marama and see what they what they thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, there were some really important things uh, that he did, and it's – well, for a start, the government of the day was going to pass some legislation which mm. was very along the lines of our Foreshore and Seabed Act in New Zealand. That was far worse was than that, to, though. Which was going to uh, give one group uh, a lot more advantages than another group. And the population of Fiji is split around about 50-50, it was then, of uh, ethnic Fijians and uh, the uh, Indian population who are descended from those who are brought in as indented laborers uh, mm -hmm. during the, the uh, British rule in India and uh, a variety of other immigrants. So it's just about a 50 50 split. And this legislation was going to give the ethnic Fijians um, you know, considerable advantage over the others. And anyway, the way the story was told to me was that uh, Bani Marama was in parliament and he said to the prime minister, Prime Minister, if you pass this legislation, I'm taking over tomorrow. Uh, one of his aides leaned over to him and whispered in his ear, tomorrow is the uh, annual rugby match between the police and the army. Yep. And without without any hesitation, Barney Rama looked up and said, if you do this, I'm taking it over on Monday. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the most popular rugby matches in, in Fiji, the army versus police. The other one is the, is the school's final, which uh, I actually went to the rugby with Frank Biney Marama to watch one of those um, schoolboy games, and I've never seen a more brutal game of rugby in my life. <laughs> That'd be right. Now, they, they, the Fijians live for rugby. They're just absolutely nuts on them, even, even more so than us. Yeah, but you're quite right, because Lysenia Ngarase um, was in power, and he was utterly corrupt. And this is the problem, the perennial problem that they have in Fiji is corruption. But Ngarase's proposal was to basically confiscate private land and then give it to Itaukai. Yeah. And, of course, it was all coastal land that we were talking about. Now, yeah. naturally, that affects all of the resorts. It affects all of the hotels. They're all on the coast. There's nothing in the, in the highlands that, that's remotely valuable or anything like that. It was all designed there to depossess people who owned property on the foreshore and then to take that into Itaukai control. And and you're absolutely right. Frank Bunny Marama did say to Ngarase, if you do that, I'm yeah. I'm gonna take over. And Garrisay, of course, did do that. And uh, we saw the 2006 coup. 
which removed him from power. But the interesting thing is he also, once he took over, is he effectively cancelled the Great Council of Chief, Chiefs. Yeah, but I, I just, I'd like to write, run through the stuff that I, I've actually made some notes. Yeah. So I get, there, there are a number of things that he did that I, I think were, were worth me just running through. This sure. is what the people told me. He set the judiciary because they were corrupt. Yeah. And the New Zealand and Australian governments and press shrieked, evil man, he sacked the judiciary. He sacked them because they were corrupt. Mm -hmm. He set up a commission to write a new constitution, and he told them, uh, you'll give me one man, one vote, all equal, or I will sack you. Yep. So they didn't, so he sacked them. So he put up, set up another commission, and he told them again, you, you will give me um, a constitution with one man, one vote, uh, all equal, or I will sack you. And they didn't give them equal, so he sacked them. And, of course, the New Zealand press and our governments went ballistic and shrieked, evil man, uh, evil dictator, sacking his constitution committee. He set up a third one, and he told them also, one man, one vote, all equal, or I'll sack you. Well, they gave him one man, one vote in the constitution. I've read through it, and I, I just find the clauses that, that say that. And so he didn't sack them, so he, you know, they got the new constitution. Mm, that's right. And... Um... You, you mentioned about him saying, I'll take over on Monday. On the Sunday, he took the troops from Victoria Barracks for a run. And uh, there's a video of it. Um, you can find it on YouTube. It's highly amusing. There's uh, Frank uh, Bainu Marima jogging with his troops through the streets of Suva from Victoria Barracks and sort of down along the waterfront and up through the main street of Suva and, and back again. And, of course, the media in New Zealand wrote that up as uh, Bainu Mara flexing his muscles. Well, he was, of course, doing that. But then when he did take over, we had that awful Barbara Drever from Radio New Zealand, who wasn't even in Fiji at the time, who did some news stories about it, about the coup, and she described it as, as the Fiji army under uh, the dictator Bainu Mara has put tanks on the streets of Suva. Now that's been scrubbed from Radio New Zealand's um, archives. You can't find it if you if you try. And I think it was also on TV and Z. You can't find it. But she said it, and so consequently, Bainu Marama said, "Well, you can't come here anymore because you don't tell the truth." And of course, she screeched about that. But uh, the ironic thing is, is there were no tanks on the streets in Suva because quite simply, no, is is the Fiji Army doesn't have any tanks. I mean, the best armoured vehicle that they've got is like a mine-proof vehicle that will, it called an MRAP. But most of them are overseas, and, and, all, and very few of them are in Fiji. Anyway, um, just, got to, just going down my little list, sure. corruption was rife. It wasn't just the judiciary. It was it was right throughout the whole, uh, the whole yeah. country was corruption. And we, we were astounded in 2012 to see signs on the side of the road saying, if you see corruption, ring me with Bainarama's personal uh, cell phone number. That's how seriously he took it. Ethnic Fijians were really exploiting the Fiji Indian population. A taxi driver told me before Bunny Marama, if he had an ethnic Fijian passenger after dark, he never got paid. And yeah. similar things happened in shops. And uh, once Bunny Marama came along, there was no more trouble. And then the shops themselves uh, used to be a little bit shonky in the way they did business. And after Bunny Marama, they didn't dare because the Fiji police were quite quite abrupt and the, the jails aren't that comfortable, and uh, Bainu Marama made use of them to shake out the corruption. Yeah, the Fiji um, prison service is quite interesting. If you don't have a relative who will bring you food each day, you don't get any. Yeah. <laughs> it's very yep. basic. The old Suva prison, which was just uh, around the corner, you know, in, in Lamy there, um, around the corner from the offices of the Fiji Sun, uh, was a brutal prison. Uh, an awful place that you – but you'd see at lunchtime about 11 o'clock people lining up and they had food and supplies for the, for their loved ones who were in prison. And it is a, a – look, justice in Fiji is often very rough. Yep. I, I remember when some years after the, the original coup of, of Baini Marama, there was three sort of rapists that had escaped from uh, Suva prison and then spent the following week – uh, marauding their way around various different suburbs of Suva. And eventually they were caught. But what the police did is they uh, handcuffed these guys and chucked them in the back of the ute because uh, the police will drive utes with open trays on them, chucked these guys in the back of the ute with a spare tyre that was loose and, and then proceeded to drive around the streets of Suva 
which at that stage were, were pretty bad, leaving them all battered and bruised by this roaming spare tyre that kept bouncing around the place. And then they would pull up uh, in the communities at these, and they'd raped some grandmothers and um, assaulted people and all of that sort of thing. And then the police would pull up in, in those streets and they would uh, get these prisoners out and uh, handcuff them around a power pole. And then they would uh, say to the, you know, one of the locals, oh, we just need to have a cup of tea to get your statement for what these guys did and leave them there. And, of course, everyone in the, in the, um, in the suburb would then come out and give them a hiding. And that was all before they went back to prison. <laughs> it was uh, it, it was not not a place to get uh, get into. Um, the other things that the man did. Um, a lot of children didn't go to school before him yep, because they right. couldn't afford the school bus fare, mm-hmm. and so he made free school buses. Yep. Um, there was a hydroelectric station up in the hills above Nandi and been there for years. The village had been told if they gave the land to the uh, to, 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 for the scheme, they would get free power. The scheme was built, but the free power never happened over many, many years until Barnum took over and they got their free power. Roads were a total mess, and you just mentioned those Suva roads and those guys getting bounced around, and he fixed them. Now, I don't know where he got the money to fix them. Could have been China, could have been anywhere. But anyway, the roads were fixed. That's what the people told me. The new constitution stripped the great council of chiefs of all their power. Yep. They ceased to function. They had been, had considerable power over government under Bainimarama that stopped. He delayed elections and the press and government in New Zealand and sh- Australia shrieked dictator. And given the scope and depth of his reforms, he had no choice. He had to bed them in before an election was held. And when it was held, Bainimarama won by a colossal landslide. Yeah. Uh, just touching on the great council of chiefs. This is the hilarious thing about the Great Council of Chiefs, right, is the New Zealand media and and Australian media in particular write about Fiji all the time and they talk about this travesty that Frank Frank Bainimarama had disestablished by decree uh, in March 2012 the Great Council of Chiefs. And this was awful. This was how Fiji was governed uh, before the British came. Of course, that's not true, right? The, the, The Great Council of Chiefs was actually a colonial construction, uh, an artifice that Sir Arthur Gordon, who was the governor of Fiji at the time in 1876, decided that he would uh, set up this great council of chiefs, and and uh, that's how they would govern the colony's indigenous population. So it wasn't how they actually operated before the British turned it into a colony. It was a construction of the British colonial government at the time in order to give the appearance that they were controlling the Itaukai population uh, via the Great Council of Chiefs. And, of course, anybody who knows anything about Fiji is that the the Ratus uh, or the chiefs are actually just um, a basic title that, that really doesn't mean anything because the great power in Fiji is vested in women and uh, the land and tribal land and, and the passing on of that land is via the female line uh, of families, not through um, a chief or or a ratu, as they're called in Fiji. So here was this system that was put in place by the British to control uh, the Fijians and the New Zealand media and the Australian media always talk about this is awful, it's taking away the rights of Fijians. The rights that were given to them by the British in the first place. It's, it's I had a very of... interesting occasion. We were invited to the uh, celebration of the Independence Day, which is uh, you know just quite an important event in Fiji. Yep. And we were invited to the VCC village, and uh, it's a it was a huge honour because it, it's a very significant day, and we had to carefully follow all the protocols as to where we sat, where we could walk, and where we could sit. Yep, it was a large village and would have had strong links to the Great Council of Chiefs. After the ceremony, I joined a group of elders on the porch of a house talking about a variety of things. And to be welcomed to that group was a pretty, really honouring, you know, because we, we'd lived in the area for so long, and, and months, but I, we'd interacted with the community. You know, we, we'd become a part of their community almost. And anyway, um, because I was aware that this village was a significant village and quite likely had a pretty tight ties to uh, the great council of chiefs. I, I was interested in how they thought Bani Rama had gone. So I asked him, I said, well, what do you think of Bani Rama? Now, we, here we are six years into his rule. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said, well, we were worried. And we watched him. And uh, we have made our minds up. And we think that he's very good for Fiji. 
I mean, there was an amazing transformation um, in the six years from the coup till 2012. It, and even in, in the following two years in 2014, when democracy was returned to Fiji, now, I was up in up in Fiji uh, in 2012, and I hadn't been there for quite some time. And I was astonished in 2012 just how run down, particularly the roads. I mean, the preferred method of transport in Fiji um, for those who, have, who can afford it is four wheel drives, and there's a reason for that because they'll have they have potholes that will swallow a small car. But what I saw in 2012 was a positiveness that was coming out of the population, and it was equal as well. The po- population of e that were seeing the, that the country improved, services were improving, those sorts of things, and the Indian population who felt they were finally getting a fair go for the amount of work and effort that they put into, you know, basically running most of the businesses and keeping the keeping everything running. But it was astonishing to see the improvement. And I asked uh, Frank Bainey Marima how that came about. And he says, oh, it was very simple. He said, when we took over in the coup in 2006, and you have to remember too that coups in Fiji are are rather gentlemanly the way they do them. The exception, of course, was George Spate's coup in uh, 2000. But um, they generally don't have any ammunition in their rifles. They block about three or four streets. They take control of the bridge at Lamy and on the other side of Suva and control entrance into and out of of Suva. And the government sector is is a, is a small little area, and they basically take control of that and then say, right, now we've, we've changed our government. But Barney Marima said what they did is they found that all of the councils in all of the cities and towns around Fiji were kind of ineffective. They didn't even do the basics right. They didn't clear away rubbish. They didn't make the water, make sure the water worked. They didn't clear drains. They didn't do all the things that a council should be doing. So what he did is he said, right, well, this town here, that's got, you know, 5,000 people. We'll put a captain in charge of that. And this town here, that's got 10,000 people. We'll put a major in charge of that. So he sacked all the councils, put in the army with the with the troops of the captain or the major or whatever, and then set about making sure that the councils worked. And, of course, everybody was happy with this because the rubbish was being collected, the water was working, and and the uh, the essential services that had been run down and dilapidated was suddenly being fixed by these strapping, burly uh, soldiers that were not brooking any nonsense at the same time. And the same thing happened in Law and Order. He put the army in charge of the police department and they set about uh, knocking a few people on the head and um, and sorting out the crime problem. And you ask anybody in Fiji what it's like during a coup and they say, oh, it's great, there's no crime. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, my overriding thoughts of this thing that I just read out to you and, and mm. sort of described was why on earth New Zealand and Australia was, and, 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 the, and the governments and press were shrieking at him because he's doing what needed to be done. You know, and in New Zealand, we we're going the other way and we have gone the other way. And uh, we are now in, in a fairly dire situation because we haven't followed that sort of pattern. Mm. Oh, absolutely. That's um, the great travesty really of how New Zealand and Australia treated Fiji and and it's hurt the Fijians like the people I know up there that I talk to all the time they talk about the betrayal of uh, Fiji by Australia and New Zealand yeah, that absolutely instead yeah. of assisting them to return to democracy they decided to go to war with Frank Barney Marima and uh and, and and you know the reasons for his coup were honorable the reasons for his coup were to get rid of corruption. Now, it didn't kind of like he had, was in power for a long time and, you know, won two elections and then lost the third election, uh, but only just. You know, still, the, Fiji First was still the major party, but a lot of things improved. But between 2012 and 2014, when I went back to Fiji after two years, the, the changes were astonishing. You had brand new shopping centres. Yeah. Uh, you had brand new roads from the airport. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever flown into uh, Nausori Airport, uh, which is Suva's main airport. It's a very, very short runway, and the road was appalling. You know, and people didn't like doing it. And um, but they improved that, and and they're working on extending the runway now. So all of these things happened under Bainy Marima. Again, I don't know how he paid for them, whether the Chinese paid or. But but I asked him about that. I said. 
well, what about the Chinese um, paying for this? And he says, oh, yes, but you know, everyone thinks that we're selling out to the Chinese. But when push comes to shove, if they get a bit stroppy, then we'll just de deport them and keep what they've spent their money on. <laughs> so, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of his style. There's no, yeah. no nonsense. He just de de deals to them as, as they have to be done. So, uh, yeah, so uh, one of the things that I noted about the people, you know, being among them for that time, is they, they, at 2012 and the subsequent years I was there after that, they were proud of the country. They were proud of what they'd achieved. And one thing I, I noticed was when there's a disaster, and all the trees fall down and roofs are ripped off and so on, uh, they just get stuck in and fix it. Yeah. No, they don't wait for someone else to come and do it. They get their axes and their hand saws and whatever else they need to do it, and they just deal to it. And uh, I, I think they're an impressive people. Well, you know, you're right about that pride, especially when it comes to things like football or rugby. You know, I was in Fiji at the time that the Fijians won the gold medal at the Olympics in the sevens. And uh, they made uh, seven dollar banknotes, and uh, and and issued coins as well for that victory. And it was astonishing just how many Fijians were were running around trying to get hold of a seven dollar Fiji banknote to commemorate that. But watching that game live in the GPH in Suva, it was just amazing. And in the party afterwards, it carried on for two days. Yeah. The pride of Fiji to win a gold medal at the Olympics yeah. Yeah. was incredible, yeah. just incredible. Yeah. Uh, and well, Fijians well, are sometimes. proud. Yeah, Fiji Fijians are proud of of their country. And I was born in Fiji, and I'm proud of the country I was born in. And one thing that Frank Bainimarama did that was very positive. He said, "Anybody who was born in Fiji is a Fijian." That was, it, that was the big thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no more Itaukai, there's no more Indian, there's no more Vulangi, there's no more of this of this nonsense. If you're born in Fiji, you are a Fijian by birth. Yep. It is your right to be called a Fijian. And, from, and his, was, from his constitution, declare that we are all Fijians united by common and equal citizenship. Yeah. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful if we saw that in New Zealand? Well, you know, that, that's, you know, as I said, even way back then when things weren't as bad as they are in New Zealand now, but we could see the, the seeds were being sown. I thought to myself, this guy's doing what we need. He is. But, you know, but like all politicians, the wheels fell off a bit towards the end uh, with, with Frank Bynamara. I mean, I, I got on really well with him. I even had a game of touch rugby with him and his bodyguards one day. Uh, I, I was driving past... Um, the U USP, and I saw some people playing on the football field, and I thought, oh, that's Frank Bonnie Marimer. Oh, no, I'll park the car and get out. Well, next minute he comes over, Cam, Cam, come on, play. You you play against me. And one of his bodyguards says, oh, you got to know the rules, bro. The rules are don't, ta don't tackle the boss. <laughs> so we played touch rugby for a, an hour or so. I was absolutely knackered, and here's this guy, the Prime Minister of Fiji, Running around on the field with soldiers um, and keeping up with them, I was knackered. Um, but and he was but, a big man too. He was a big man. Yeah, but he, that's how accessible he was yeah. um, to the people of Fiji. Now, well, he it, came it, in and he, he saw it needed to be done, and he dealt to it in in every area. Exactly. Um, you know, if you look at his attorney general, that's a different story altogether. Now, I, I got on all pretty well with I as Syed Kayam, uh, reasonably well. Uh, went to a rugby match with him too. Uh, I think it was Queen Vic versus uh, another school. Um, and he, of course, was uh, an, an old boy of Queen Vic. But he went and sat in the, in the stand in the middle, midst of the other people just so that you know he could be seen with those people to show that there's no hard feelings. This is a, a football match. But um, unfortunately... Bainu Marima came to rely more and more and more upon Ayaz Sayed Kayum. And unfortunately, him and his uh, father and his brother had different designs uh, on the economy for, for Fiji than perhaps what people were hoping for. Yeah. He's still got an iron grip over the Fiji First Party, um, and it's a terrible shame because my experience of him and interacting with him is is not as pleasant as, as it was with Frank Bainu Marima, let's say. Yeah. 
we had just on a subsequent visit, there'd been a, a major uh, cyclone gone through mm. and flattened. There was like one village was blown off the planet. It just disappeared from the top of the hill down into the gully and it didn't exist anymore. And we loaded the boat up before we left New Zealand with, uh, I thought, well, what, what do they need? They hammers and hand saws and nails and all sorts of practical stuff. So we loaded the boat up with all this stuff and took it with us. Mm. And then we hired a car and we drove around. We looked for villages that were in trouble. We stopped and handed out all this stuff. And that, that was... But, you know, they were really happy to receive hand saws and hammers, and that, that's what they need to put it back together again. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen that um, in villages too. It it doesn't take a lot of money to make a big difference in no. places like Fiji, particularly in the villages. But that had been used in the past by corrupt politicians because after Bainu Marama took over, he conducted an investigation into the Electoral Commission and replaced everybody in the Electoral Commission, conducted this investigation about the last election that had had elected in Garrisay as the Prime Minister, of which he removed him. And they found some appalling uh, situations that had occurred uh, during the election campaign where um, you had the Methodist Church that was involving itself in politics and they were facilitating the handing out of either tractors or outboard motors, depending on where the village uh, was located. If they were in the highlands, they got a tractor, and if they were on the coast, they got uh, outboard engines, and the proviso was to vote for Ngarase's government. Of course, what happened is they ran out of tractors, but had plenty of outboard motors, and ended up giving outboard motors to some of these remote villages in the highlands of Fiji on on Viti Levo. Only the Methodists would do that. (laughs) Right. So... Um, th- that's one example. You had one electorate that had 28 registered voters a- in that electorate, and yet 427 votes were cast for Ngarase's party. Yeah. You, ha- you had a situation where the Methodist Church was restuffing the um, ballot boxes. And so one of the innovations with the Fiji Electoral um, Office when they when they were created under Baini Marama was that all ballot boxes in the voting booths would be transparent. Yeah, you know, we've got cardboard ones here in New Zealand, right? Um, yeah. And this is what cracks me up, right? We we lord it over Fiji and we say, you know, you need to do what we do because we're not corrupt. Uh, well, I say bullshit to that. Yeah, um, so it, uh, in Fiji, they decided what you're going to do now is we're going to have these plastic bins with a slot in it and there'll be a seal on those bins and when the polling booth opens and the first person comes in, they can see that that bin for taking the votes is empty. And you, the only way you can put anything into that bin is for uh, you know people to cast their vote. And, and this is the other thing they did. They made everybody have a voter ID card, not like our easy vote card, right, which is mailed out. You actually had to apply for it and it would have a photo on it and it would have your fingerprint on it. As well, and people were driving around Fiji in the 2014 election with purple fingers from the fingerprint, and um, they were proud of of being able to vote, and they showed that. But also, they said, "Well, you this is you live in this area, so this is the polling booth that you can go to, and here's the role for that polling booth, and no one else is allowed to vote there." Yeah. Right. So it yep. tight tightly controlled the count. It tightly controlled the transparency of the elections. It did slow it down a little bit, but you know, that was funny. In 2014, in that election, I was up there for it, and um, the count was coming in very slow, and I got a phone call and said, Cam, can you come down to the to the TV station? Um, we need you as a guest to go on TV. I said, oh, why do you need me? He says, oh, we just need you to talk about stuff, anything. It'll do. You can talk about anything. Just get on there. We just need to keep people occupied. <laughs> so so I go down there and get ushered into the studio. Well, I was in the in the studio for three and a half hours talking, you know, with ad breaks, and then they just said, no, stay here, keep going, keep going. And we're talking, talking. And then I saw Bindy Marima come into the studio and um then they had an ad break and he came and said, Oh, we've just about got the count sorted out. So, you know, thanks for that. But I've just tell the people to be patient to stay by the grog bowl and, uh, you know, we'll have an answer shortly. So here I was on Fijian television telling everybody who was watching uh, the thing that, uh, you know, I've got a message from the Prime Minister. He says, 
stay by the grog bowl and um, stay calm and we'll have a result soon. <laughs> Half an hour later, there was. But yeah. that's how it worked in Fiji. I just want something. to drop back uh, to the beginning of when what, what the what Absolutely. Fact, uh, was face, facing when he did his coup. Mm. Was, after the 2000 coup, a lot of the land leases that were, were the, uh, the Indian uh, farmers had the land leases for growing the, the sugar cane. Yeah. And uh, most of those leases were lost uh, after the 2000 coup. And I guess it hadn't improved by the time that Frank took over. But the Indian population were leaving in droves. Yes. And they were the people who were doing the stuff. Yeah, most so, of the uh, exodus. Yeah, it's a serious issue to deal with. Yeah, I mean, when you had Rambuka's first um, two coups, they were very um, vehemently pro Itaukai and against Indians. And you yeah. saw a mass exodus of the best and brightest from Fiji yeah. after Rambuka's two coups. And of course, you had Spate um, having his rather nasty coup, and, and the only coup actually where shots were fired. Um, and Frank Bernie Marimer during that 2000 coup was actually being um, hunted down by Spate's henchmen and uh, members of the army that had mutinied. And uh, he had actually crawled out of the Victoria barracks in a drain. Um, and so that's why he always called, uh, you know, Spate it refused to name him, would say he's going to stay in prison and die there. And it's also why he also, um, what he called uh, Rambuka the snake. Because um, Ram Booker is, was part and parcel of some of the uh, excesses that went on under his coups. Ram Booker went around and campaigned at the last election and prostrated himself before the population and apologised and said that he was wrong to have done his two coups in the way that he done, did them and that he was going to um, you know, stick with the Constitution and do all those things. Of course, subsequently... He's he's gone back on all of that, of um, he is. and is and is actually acting almost like a dictator again, albeit with a one vote majority in the parliament. Um, so but when yeah, I heard that he he got back in again, I thought, poor old Fiji, you're going back to where you were. Well, I was willing to to give. You know, it takes a little bit of something of somebody for them to apologise for things they did in the past, and I was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I'd seen how the Bainy Marama government had lost its way and maybe an election was the way to sort that out. But I'm pretty sure from my talking to people up in Fiji that they actually now uh, would fondly like Frank Bainy Marama back as the Prime Minister and let's uh, not have uh, sort of any Rambuka as the Prime Minister anymore um, because he's bringing back the great Council of Chiefs. Yeah. He's uh, sacked a whole lot of uh, civil servants uh, because they're the wrong sort of civil servant. They're not Itaukai. They're either European uh, or they're um, or Indian. And he's got a policy of 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 populating all of the uh, judges and all of the government institutions with Itaukai. And there's been a real clearing out of the civil service, with no improvements, of course, in Can service. You must be understanding and seeing parallels in New Zealand. Oh, absolutely. It. it you know, this is what staggers me is I saw under Bainy Marama a a refusal to engage in race-based politics. Yep. Everyone in the country who was born here is a Fijian. Yep. And that's my view on New Zealand, and it was my view being brought up in New Zealand. Yours and mine too. Right. And, and I, that man was doing a really good job. Yeah. And all we could do was abuse him. Yeah, and we treated him shabbily, and then we wonder why Fiji turned its back on Australia and New Zealand and decided to you know, become a member of the non-aligned movement, which is filled with a bunch of ratbag countries like Iran and China and India and things like that. We did that, not them. Yeah. We did it. We, we made them feel like second-class citizens in their own home, and we turned the Fijians against mainly Australians, uh, Australians are not well liked in Fiji, just quietly. Uh, Kiwis are much better liked, but political Kiwis are not liked at all unless they're Winston Peters. Um, but that's because he sits down and talks with them, practicing Talanoa, um, respectful discourse, and not lecturing them. Yeah. Um, again, it gives me a, a cause to think about when um, John Key decided he was going to go to Fiji and fly into Suva. Well, clearly hadn't been informed. The only way that he, he was going to take a 757, well, 757s can't land at Suvri Airport at Nasori. So he well, ended up. 
Well, it's too short. The runway is too short. Oh, no, that, that could have uh, <laughs> an interesting outcome. So he went up there in a in a crap, clapped out Hercules, and then he arrived at the airport and then taken to a, a function to welcome him to the country. He had a speech all there, and I I was given a copy of Barney Marimer's speech ahead of time so I could publish it on my website. And Barney Marimer just gave John Key a kicking that he'll never forget. About how New Zealand had been a poor friend to Fiji, that they had, um, you know, we had to have the coup because we had to remove corruption, and it just listed all of the things and said, and you and your government opposed all of this. You didn't like all of this, and so that's where it went from there. Of course, Helen Clark hated uh, Barney Marimer, so he had a dislike for New Zealand politicians. But uh, Winston Peters uh, and Shane Jones, when he was the Fisheries Commissioner, they really enjoyed the confidence of the Fijians and still do. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. It, 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 was a, it was a fascinating time for me to be up there and it was quite humbling to be welcomed as I was and told the stuff, sort of stuff I was by the people really speaking their hearts to me. So it was, it was great. But that's the thing, Danny. That was my experience. Uh, like I, I fondly remember the 2014 election. Now, it's funny because the 2014 election in Fiji was ahead of the New Zealand 2014 election, and I was in Fiji to cover that. And there was all these New Zealand journalists running around trying to find out where Frank was or where... Uh, uh, where the corruption was. They were looking for the corruption. No, but they were trying to interview him and do all of this. Now, I would just text him and say, uh, hey, um, whereabouts are you? And he'd say, oh, I'm at, at my place. Um, come round. Right, so I was up at the Prime Minister's residence drinking kava with the Prime Minister while the New Zealand media were running around trying to find him. And they were doing stand-ups outside the uh, outside the pavilion that's uh, in the park opposite the, the GPH, the rugby pavilion, because that's where they were told that he was going to appear once the re- results were known. He had no intention of appearing there once the results were known. If they had bothered they would have found that out, but but they didn't because they stood there giving false impressions about what was going on. And that's why I got you on the show, because you actually spoke to people in Fiji. You got anecdotal evidence on the, how people felt. Yeah. Um, you spoke to cab drivers. You spoke to people in the villages. And that's what the journalists don't actually do. Yeah. You know, They don't do that in Fiji. They go up there with their own uh, prejudices about Fiji stand there and lecture the Fijians about how you should act and, and behave and then wonder why they get banned um, from coming to Fiji. And as um, as Bonnie Marimer said to me about Barbara Drevers, she, says she just tells lies, so she can't come here. No, that's very really sad. And I, I just repeat myself to say that uh, what I saw there looked like a blueprint for, for New Zealand. That we needed, to, we we needed to sort things out. And you're just talking about the uh, the councils and how they, they you put a captain or a major or a colonel in charge of different uh, different communities. And uh, wouldn't that help us? Well, well, it would. But I look at New Zealand and where we're heading. And uh, you know, after six years of the Ardern Hipkins regime, race relations are a worse state than they ever have been in New they Zealand. Yeah. Uh, and we've got this uh, radical Maori. Uh, separatist rabble that are, are pushing an agenda. And, uh, you know, only this week um, they've been, you know, promising to protest and grind the this, this streets to a halt with their process to remove a colonialist government. Well, it's ironic that they're using a colonialist invention called the motor car to do it, but that's what they're saying they're going to do. Not to mention the roads. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is you know, they're on uh, you know Instagram and they're, and they're making statements. This is... Uh, Rawari Waititi's wife, who is John Tamahiri's daughter, she's on there talking about revolution, uh, talking about usurping the government, about removing the government from power, and that they have enough power themselves to be able to take over. Those are all, that's all insurrectionist and violent behavior, and the media are cheering them on. There's no it used to be treason. Well, it used to be called treason, but that's exactly what they want to do. There's this yeah. belief that Maori before uh, the arrival of Europeans was this Nirvana-type society where everyone lived in, in peace and harmony and looked after the environment and, and uh, everything was fantastic. 
Of course, the reality of the situation was there were warring tribes at each other's throat with an average age expectancy of 35, um, living in cold, uh, drafty huts with uh, mud floors. There's a book written by one of uh, Hongi Hika's um, descendants. Uh, it's called uh, Hongi Hika Warrior Chief. If anyone wants to dispel any false notions they have about the uh, pre-European uh, in New Zealand, they need to read that book. Well, I mean, you know, Hongi Hika, a few years before the treaty was signed in 1840, uh, took a war party down to Coromandel and took 2,000 slaves and marched them back to Napui territory. Uh, and of course, in 1840, he was dead by 19, by 1840, but his son-in-law, uh, Hone Hiki, uh, signed the treaty. And uh, in the treaty, of course, it promises the, the, the chiefs all of their possessions to be retained, which of course included slavery, the slaves that they had. Uh, but we're not allowed to say that. We're not allowed to discuss that anymore because that's not, that's not the heroic um, fairy tale uh, of Maori society that, that we uh, are allowed to know. You know, they tell us something different, and and we we shove that that's shoved down our throat all the time. So yeah, I think we could learn from what Frank Frank Barney Marama did in between two thousand and six and two thousand and fourteen. Uh, certainly, having a written constitution would be helpful because we don't. But um, you know, if we had a written constitution, how it would be written, and well, it would be a, a, a shocking document. I imagine it would be an appalling document written by academics and wombles. Yep. That wouldn't say anything, and you could drive a truck through the gaps in it. So very scary. So well, anyway, that was my experience in Fiji. It was uh, a wonderful place to be. I enjoyed it immensely. I, I, I'm not going there now at, at these days because uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, I certainly enjoyed it when I did go there. And uh, it was great to be taken into the confidence of the people the way we were. The Fijian people are very um, accommodating to tourists, particularly from New Zealand, and all we have to do is sit down with them and practice uh, the Fijian or Pacific uh, concept of talanoa, that's, you know, having discourse with respect, and you'll find that they'll become your friends. Yeah. And uh, Fiji's a wonderful place. It's the place of my birth. When, when I get off the plane in Suva, you know, I f actually feel it's really strange. I get this feeling that I'm home, yeah. uh, even though I've lived the majority of my life in New Zealand. Uh, Fiji is home for me. Uh, I got a number of my friends here in Auckland are, were born in Fiji at a similar time to me as well. We're all Kaivetis. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful place. And I think that New Zealanders could learn from that, particularly around this concept of one person, one vote, and that everybody is uh, as a New Zealander um, because they're born here, not not for any other reason. There's no preferred race or or, or anything like that. There was a, a tourism advertisement from Fiji years ago now, and they, they showed the the beautiful water and the palm trees and the little islands, and and they said Fiji the way the world should be. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's been a fascinating chat, and I'm glad that you wrote me that letter. And uh, it's good for the listeners to to actually get to have a say sometimes rather than just via an email or or a letter. Yeah. I really appreciate talking to you, Cam, is I had this information I got from the people, and, and I, it's fairly – compared with the what is the consumption in New Zealand of what, what went on, it was so radically different. I, I wondered if I if I really had it right, but I was sure I had. And to hear you confirming it all, I, I've been very, very pleased to hear it all confirmed. I wasn't uh, running down the wrong path. I, I actually did have it nailed. No, the, you you did have it nailed. That was the feeling, the overriding feeling that I picked up. You know, when I was visiting between uh, you know 2010 and 2018 it was the last time I was in Fiji. That was just before my stroke. So that was the feeling I had. It was a very positive place that was finally growing, finally stepping out of the coup culture. But sadly, um, you know, the election went a different way, and uh, they've ended up with Ram Booker and his a bunch of fellow travellers um, who are decidedly racist and uh, and don't I don't believe they've got the best interests of Fijians at heart. Well, what you've told me about the replacement of the of the staff uh, with uh, ethnic Fijians rather than the people who are doing the job, uh, it just shows the corruption is going to be rife again. It, it well, can't I mean, help it. A classic example is the former director of uh, well, he's been suspended by the Rambuka government, Christopher Pride. He's a New Zealander, and you know, interestingly. Christopher Pride was on a blacklist 
from New Zealand because um, they considered him to be part of the regime of Baini Marama. And so for a number of years, he was marooned in Fiji because he couldn't even come back to his own country. But anyway, he was the director of public prosecutions. Rambuka came in. They suspended him for the high crime of being at an embassy function and having a photograph taken of him talking to the former attorney general, um, Ayers uh, Saeed Qayyum. That was his high crime to be suspended. Uh, they replaced him with a guy who uh, cannot hold the position of Director of Public Prosecution because that's a constitutional position that's that's outlined in the Constitution. That person cannot have ever had any sort of professional standards complaints upheld against him. He's got uh, numerous uh, complaints against him from the Law Society, and yet he's the Acting Director of Public Prosecutions. He's also the man that was involved in prosecuting uh, Frank Bainu Marama. So there's questions uh, that's going to be have to be taken to the Supreme Court in Fiji over the the prosecution of Frank Bainu Marama by a person who shouldn't have even been in the job in the first place. Um, um, I, I have no knowledge of what his uh, Bainu Marama was convicted of or uh, why he was convicted, but I have um, just an instinctive feel that it was a kangaroo court. I, I just don't believe that what I knew of Frank and what he did, uh, that he could have, been, have done what they say he did. It's a, it was a kangaroo court on trumped up charges, um, yep. you know, not dissimilar to what's happening to Trump. But yep. uh, he, he's now in Naboro prison, uh, ironically, uh, in the same prison as George Spate um, for a year. Yep. So, um, but I imagine there's going to be some fallout from that. We'll just have to wait and see. But uh, Danny, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and to get your to get your uh, insights of what what you saw in Fiji and how just to show to to listeners uh, that uh, impressions of people who have been there are far better than the impressions or the reckons of a media uh, face that uh, that hasn't been there for a number of years. All good, thank you. All right, thanks, Danny. It was uh, appreciated that. All too often we find our views are formed by media organisations and not from any real perspective by people on the ground who are affected by events or issues. And that's why I decided to bring Danny on the show. It's great we can have people like Danny Sims on the show to highlight issues like this from a more real, even if it is anecdotal, perspective. Tell me your thoughts on what Danny had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.